a student asked me if I could make a video about uh, problem solving techniques. And I thought that was a great idea because the principles involved in these first few chapters aren't so difficult, but applying them to real life problems often is. And so let's uh, look at a few problem solving techniques that may come up frequently. So the one that I think is, is a great idea is to always write down an example of the kind of thing that you're counting. Because in writing down that example, you're gonna see what choices you're making in order to fulfill all the constraints. It's sometimes very helpful to explain how to identify this example quickly. Sometimes it helps people to enumerate all the options, just write everything out. Uh, this is really only possible for small numbers. Or if you wanna program it on Sage, you could make longer lists and count how many there are using Sage. So sometimes you can even substitute smaller numbers or a smaller situation into your problem, write out all those options, and then, um, and then try to think what would happen if you, if you went up to bigger numbers. And then the last two I think are some of the most important. One of them is to think, how would I write down this example a step at a time? First making a choice, then making another choice, then making another choice. And that's quite different from the last possible problem solving technique is to instead think about the total outcome. And the difference between D and E can often be summarized as, uh, does the order of your objects matter? If yes, then thinking sequentially is gonna make a big difference. Or if the order doesn't matter, for example, like five cards in a hand, then the total outcome the total outcome might be a better way to go. One thing that's tricky about that is that sometimes it's possible to think sequentially when it's not really obvious that how to do that. Um, and sometimes it's possible to think about the total outcome for a sequential problem. So these things are, can be difficult to apply in practice. So let's, um, let's do a few examples here. So where's my pen? Oh, it's not plugged in. All right. Okay, so now where's the pen? I told you I'd get good at this before you got better at combinatorics, but I'm not sure. If that's, okay, here we go. Okay, so um, let's look at problem um, problem one. Okay, so we're gonna to try to figure out um, um, how many five digit numbers have no, um, no repeated digits. Okay, so as an example about uh, one of these numbers, I might um, do the number um, two, three, five, um, seven, nine. And so already writing this out, we can see that as we were going through, once I decided that this first number was two, that constrained all the future choices to not be two. And so this is clearly an example where we should think sequentially. So this, for this first digit, um, we have nine choices because this first digit can't be a zero. So it can be any of the numbers from one to nine. Uh, for the second digit, uh, we also have nine choices uh, because it can be zero to nine, but not the first digit. And then um, the next one then, no matter whether, um, what the first and the second two are, we then have eight choices for this next one. And then seven choices for this one. And then six choices uh, for this one. And so all together we're gonna have nine times nine times eight times seven times six. 
And then this, I, I didn't work it out, but you can figure out what that equals on Sage. So um, a general strategy for this type of problem is to then write these out with letters, A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. And here we can see that the order really does, does matter. All right, so let's change this problem a little bit. Um, let's stick with five digit numbers, but instead um, work with um, no consecutive repeated digits. So in this case, this almost sounds like the same thing that we had before. And in particular, the example we wrote down before, this still, this still works perfectly fine. And so let's think a bit about um, what would be something that doesn't work in this situation that did work um, in the last problem. This is just like in a real classroom where you have to erase and erase and erase before the chalk gets off the, off the board. All right, so, 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 um, so for instance, something like two, three, um, uh, four, three, one. This is an example of something that's okay now, but not before. Because this has no digits that are the same next to each other, uh, but it does have repeated digits. So this, uh, I should have said we're now doing problem two. Okay, so, so our answer for this problem should be larger than our answer for the previous problem. And let's, so, but we still have a lot of the same numbers of choices. So again, we have, again, nine choices uh, for A1. And um, we again have nine choices for A2. So these choices were, again, one through nine. And now these nine choices are zero through nine, but not the first one. But now uh, this next one, we have more than eight choices because any of the digits zero through nine is okay as long as it's not the previous. So this is nine choices, which is zero through nine, but not A2. And then, um, and then we're gonna have nine again, and then nine again. And so altogether, the, this answer here is going to be nine to the fifth. Because we have nine choices for each digit. All right, so um, that was another example of um, writing down an example of what we're counting and thinking sequentially. Okay, so uh, let's Let's now do some other some other examples. I think I must have a way of making a all right, new page. So let's now write down um, uh, eleven letter sequences. Um, with exactly three vowels. And just to make things a little easier, uh, we're going to think of Y as a consonant in this problem. So, so let's write down an example of one of these. So for example, A, B, C, D, E. Okay, that's our, our first vowel. F, G, H, I, J. We get to 10 using two vowels. And now we need one more vowel, so let's throw in a, uh, another E. All right. So this is a place where you don't want to think sequentially. Why is that? If you were thinking sequentially, you'd have to say, let's look at the first letter. 
let's call it A1. If it's a vowel, then you're in case one and you need only two vowels left. If it's a consonant, then you need only three vowels left. So we've already broken into two cases and then we move to the second one and realize that we also have cases emerging from that because we could have had a vowel on a vowel or a vowel on a consonant or a consonant on a vowel or a consonant on a consonant. So you can see already by just looking at the first two letters that we're starting to break this problem into many cases. And anytime you get to many cases, you want to think, let me think instead about the total outcome. So uh, let's say I was trying to um, describe this example to a friend with hints to see if they could guess it quickly. I might say, okay, one hint is that the vowels are in the fifth, ninth, and eleventh place. And then I might say, my example uses um, only two vowels. And, and I might say, most letters in the alphabet are early letters in this example. So those are the kinds of things you might say when describing this. And the first thing I said was the most useful, which is that we first need to pick the spots for the vowels. Okay, well, there are, we need exactly three vowels. So we need to choose three spots out of 11. And then, um, I, then I'm looking at this problem, I'm realizing maybe I wasn't specific enough about this. When you say exactly three vowels, does that mean that there are vowels in three spots? Or does that mean that you use three vowels? So this problem actually seems a little ambiguous to me because maybe they mean like maybe it would be fine if I wrote an 11 letter sequence with just E's, I's, and O's. Would that be okay? So here, here you realize the problem's been written a little bit ambiguously, but we're gonna go with the idea that um, the vowels can repeat, um, but that what they meant to say in this problem is that there are three spots for the vowels. The vowels, the vowels can repeat. Okay, so once we do that, then we see, once we've picked these spots for the vowels, they're in five choices for the first, which in our case was E, five choices for the second, which in our case was I, and five choices for the third. And then there are eight spots left, and for each of them, we have um, 21 choices um, for the remaining Eight spots. So these are the choices of the consonant for the remaining eight spots. And so, um, so there we got twenty-one, the eighth. All right, and this is some this is some huge, huge number. Okay, so those were some. Um, this was an example where we thought more about the uh, total outcome. Let's, let's now do an example where you could do the problem in either way, but I think it's faster to think about it in terms of a total outcome. And so for this problem, we're gonna think about the number of poker flushes. So remember, if you don't know about poker, there's a whole section in chapter two going through every aspect you might wanna know about it. But so what this is, is a five, um, a five card hand, and they are all the same soon. So one way of thinking about this, if we were thinking about this sequentially, you would say, okay, we have 52 choices for the first card. Let's say, for example, it's a four of hearts. Well then, everything else needs to be a heart. So for the next card, I need to pick another heart. So I need to sort of pick um, hearts. And so I have 
Uh, well, there were 13 hearts to start with, but I already chose one. So I have, I have 12 options for the next. Maybe it's a, um, a three of hearts and then 11 options for the next. Maybe it's a jack of hearts, maybe uh, 10 hearts for the among next. Maybe it's a seven of hearts and nine options for the next. Maybe it's an 11 of hearts. Okay, and so, uh, but then we realized, oh, I could have gotten that example in a different way because I could have done a three of hearts first and then had the four of hearts and then the jack of hearts, and then the seven of hearts. And in fact, I could have, you know, gotten the 11 before the seven and that would be the, that would be the same, the same hand. So that makes, um, they realize that once we've done these choices sequentially, we then need to divide by five factorial, which allows us to rearrange the, rearrange the cards. Another way of doing this problem, okay, and you can work out that, so that's the answer. Let me tell you maybe a, a, a bad approach to this problem. Okay, pick the first card. And then let's say it's four parts. Oh no. And Okay, let's do the bad approach to this problem. Let's say you pick a card, it's four of our hearts. Then you say, okay, I need four hearts left. And well, they're out of 12. And I don't care about the order that it matters. So I'm going to just do 12, choose four. Okay, what's lousy about this is that we've now separated the hands into those where we got the four of hearts first. And so distinguished the four of hearts, one card of the hand as being the first card, but the other four, we don't matter. So the order doesn't matter. So we've been sort of inconsistent about thinking about order mattering and order not mattering. And this, uh, this, you can salvage this bad approach, but I think in general, this is not the right way to do it. And so um, it's, it's better to, it's better to try the third approach to this problem. Um, which is the total outcome, uh, the total outcome approach. Okay, so the total outcome approach, um, so like let's say you want a friend is guessing what kind of card you have, and you first thing they might try to guess is the suit. So, um, so first we're gonna figure out, so this is the total outcome approach. So what's the suit? Well, there are four options for that. And then which cards in the suit? Well then out of those 13 cards, we need to choose five. And here this um, already implicitly says that order doesn't matter among the five. So this is, I think, the best way of doing this problem. And then you can write down what the answer is very quickly. It's four times 13 factorial over five factorial times eight factorial. All right, so let's do uh, one, more, one more problem. Um, I think this is maybe the hardest one on, that we've done today. What, what number are we on, five? So um, let's say we have six jobs and five people. And we want to pair up the jobs with the people. And, um, and each person needs at least one job. So let me say that this problem is similar to the problem about pairing dogs and people in the park. 
but it's harder because now, now we have um, uh, six jobs. So job one through job six, and we have five people, person one through person five. This problem shows up in making a bipartite graph. We wanna make edges, um, for instance, connecting um, a per people with jobs. Each person needs at least one job. So there has to be an edge coming out of each of these people vertices. So we start doing that, and then since there's an extra job, somebody's got to do that. Um, maybe it's person two. All right, so this, this problem actually kind of shows up in matching problems in graph theory. So th this problem is harder than the dog problem because for the dog problem, if you want to match five people with five dogs or jobs, we sort of lined up the people and then gave person one the first choice of the, of the, of the dog and then person two the second choice of the remaining dogs. And so um, that led to the answer of bifactorial ways of matching five people with five dogs. But now this is a little bit trickier, and so we can't think of it sequentially. We have to think more about the total outcome. And the first thing that we notice in making this, this example is that one person has two jobs. So that's, that's nice, because this is, this is true no matter how we match up the people with jobs. If you were doing seven jobs and five people, this would be even um, a, a more, more tricky problem that we'll get to in uh, chapter three. So, so the first question is, who's the uh, unlucky or lucky, depending on your point of view, person? So we have the person with two jobs. And so for that, we have five choices. And then we can ask which two jobs do they have? So that's five choose two. Oh, sorry, no, six choose two, because there are six jobs. And then, and then what are we left with? We're left with um, four people and four jobs. Each person has to have then exactly one job. And so then we have we just need to uh, line up the people with the jobs. And so there are four factorial ways of permuting people and jobs. So here we're left with five times six factorial over two factorial times two factorial times four factorial. Uh, and so we're left with um, five times six factorial over, over two. All right, so uh, if you're feeling like this is hard, don't be surprised. This is, I think, part of the course that a lot of people struggle with is about getting these principles and applying them to uh, figuring out which principles and how to organize your thoughts about some of these more complicated problems. And we'll have lots of time to practice these things in the uh, next couple of weeks. Great, okay, see you next time.